All right, good evening. All right, what I'm going to do today is um, start off first and give you an idea of sort of where we are in Healing the Bay. And um, right now we're about halfway to Healing the Bay. Um, and the reason why is because we've had some extraordinary improvements at sewage treatment plants. Um, the, the biggest source of pollution to Santa Monica Bay um, back in the mid-80s was absolutely the two major sewage treatment plants. This is the Hyperion sewage treatment plant. Um, and the other one is the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant in Carson, which discharges off of White Point and Palos Verdes. They both discharge in 200 feet depth of water. Um, at, the, at the time, they were discharging about 750 million gallons per day of sewage um, into Santa Monica Bay. And what has happened is that both sewage treatment plants have upgraded their facilities, so they're now in compliance with the Clean Water Act. They both do full secondary treatment of sewage, and as a result, we've seen some dramatic improvements. Um, there's been a 95 in sewage solids going into Santa Monica Bay. So the days of having a dead zone in the middle of the bay, having sludge dumped in the middle of the bay, having fish with tumors and fin rot are luckily long gone. So we have a change in what the water pollution problems are that we really need to focus here, not only here in Southern California, but this is really true nationally as well. And this is an example of what we've seen since 1971 to 2000. This is from the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. Um, and what you see dramatically is in sewage, um, for total suspended solids, zinc, and copper, if you look at 1971 versus 2000, you've seen a dramatic reduction in the amount of pollution going into the Southern California Bight. Um, and as a result, uh, a lot of that has to do with the improvements at the sewage treatment plants, but it also has a lot to do with the improvements in industrial waste programs, where the amount of pollution actually going into the sewer system has dropped dramatically over the last few decades. Now you look at the stormwater side, which is the largest source of pollution not only to the, um, not only to the bite, but also nationally from the standpoint of, of pollutant loading. And what we see here is a dramatically different story. We basically see almost no change in the pollutant load to Santa Monica Bay. Um, and so what it shows you is despite all the stormwater programs that we've had, and you can counterbalance that with all the development that's occurred at the same time, we haven't really done a very good job in tackling the stormwater pollution problem. And so that's really the key to what, we're gonna, what we need to do to heal the bay, is to tackle the stormwater pollution problem. Whoops. Not a good start. All right. Hold on. Press the wrong button, sorry about that. The last thing is if it. All right, thank you. I did it again. I'm sorry. Which one, which one am I pressing? Now that I'm on tape doing this? Should be left click. Okay, left click. All right. All right, so just very briefly, a watershed is an area of land that drains into a body of water, such as a river, stream, lake, or ocean. This is important because we're talking about what we really need to do to tackle the problem. This is the Los Angeles region. Um, we have numerous watersheds within the region. Um, this is uh, region four in the state of California. We have the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board, Ventura County, as well as Los Angeles County. Um, the predominant focus here today, of course, is going to be on the Santa Monica Bay watershed, but just gives you a perspective. All right, this gives you an idea of the scope of what the pollution plume and stormwater can look like after rain. I don't have the photo, but there's actually even a much better satellite photo where you actually can see the plume going from Bayona Creek almost all the way to Catalina. So it gives you an idea of how big the pollution problem can be after, after a significant rain. All right, so here we are in the Malibu Creek watershed, one of, the, one of the watersheds that actually drained to Santa Monica Bay that's not hugely developed. Bayona Creek watershed is more than 70% impermeable area at this point. Here we're looking at the Malibu Creek watershed, which is roughly 22% impermeable area. As you can see, the upper watershed, there's a fair amount of development in cities like Calabasas and Agoura Hills and, and the like in Thousand Oaks, but in the lower watershed, it's largely undeveloped. 
And then the, the upper corner you have Amundsen Ranch, which is undeveloped. All right, why is this important? Because when you have an effective impervious area over 5%, this often leads to impairment of stream morphology, ecology, and water quality. So Tom Schuler from the Center for Watershed Protection um, until recently has done a lot of work on this over the years. Many people at numerous universities around the country have done similar work. And so this is holds for the Malibu Creek watershed as well. In the sub-drainages where we see much more development and more impermeable area, that's the hardscape where the rain hits and basically runs off into the stream system, um, we end up seeing obviously a much greater impact on stream morphology and ecology. When you have an effective impervious area over 25%, then basically you're at the point where even restoration efforts really don't result in huge improvement to the watershed. Um, recently within the Ventura area in the Ventura stormwater permit, a draft that's out here right now, the Natural Resources Defense Council, Regional Water Board, and Dr. Rich Horner from the University of Washington, um, they're making a recommendation to actually reduce for all new and redevelopment, um, to reduce that effective impervious area all the way down to three to five percent. So that means if you have a parcel that's getting built out, 95% of that runoff from that, from that area must be captured and infiltrated on in, the, in the parcel itself. So that's a very, very high standard um, and something that is a major, major goal. And if that occurs, that will have a huge impact in reducing stormwater pollution within, the, within Santa Monica Bay and, and beyond. Um, this is effective approach for urban areas as well as in open space. And the benefits go beyond water quality it's water supply, energy savings, because you don't have to pump as much water from long distance for water supply purposes, and of course, more livable communities. Here's an example of, what ha of the sorts of parameters of what we see when we have high impermeable area. So this is looking at the Malibu Creek watershed. And just for the sake of, of this talk, I'll keep it um, very simple, where reference location you can say would be less than that 5% barrier and then degraded would be over the 25% effective impermeable area. And I'm only bringing this out where you just look at nutrients and algal cover and what you see is obviously a dramatic difference in water quality as well as algal cover um, when you have that sort of situation. So that's, that gives you an idea of what happens within the Malibu Creek watershed. Um, you could do the same sort of thing with a wide variety of other parameters, including looking at the index of biological integrity. And in this case, you can see you have much greater spe um, species diversity, more healthy communities in reference areas than you do in highly degraded areas with very, very high um, percentages of impermeable area within the watershed. So it gives you an idea of the importance of trying to capture runoff on site and what it actually does for water quality and the ecology um, within the receiving waters. All right, so this moves us to a topic, whoops, that, well, I'll go one step back, um, which has been very important in the last few years. It's been talked about an awful lot, which is low impact development. And it's interesting because the concept itself has been around for at least 30 years, but it's, it's one of these things that um, in the last five to 10 years has taken on a uh, much greater urgency from the standpoint of what you're actually seeing people do in new and redevelopment. And what it is very simply is you want to cluster development, you want to limit the clearing, you want to maximize vegetation and preserve riparian areas. And what you also want to do is work with the land as opposed to change the land dramatically in all your new and redevelopment and try to capture as much runoff as possible on site. Um, so it could uh, basically percolate into the ground, rep replenish aquifers, instead of causing polluted runoff where it gets into the streets on parking lots and the light, where, like where it can pick up pollutants. So there's a wide variety of different examples of development that have occurred locally. Um, what you see, this sort of thing, it's not that high tech at all. And that's actually the beauty. The amount of operation and maintenance costs is pretty minimal when you take this sort of approach. So you have street runoff going into a swale. That's intestine. You have here Caltrans, where you can have uh, road runoff go into a filter strip. And a lot of times, the, the sediment that's in these strips is uh, porous media like sand, so it can percolate, remove the pollutants before it gets down to groundwater. 
Um, here we are locally, here in the city of Santa Monica with a parking lot that's 11th and Santa Monica. And, and you can see what they've done here is they've designed the flow to go into these biofilters and infiltrate into the ground. And then the runoff then in turn goes into the storm drain system where it's clean at that point. Um, here's another example where you see these pavers, um, which also allows the runoff to percolate into the ground. Um, this is out in Chino. And then here we have sidewalk situation where the runoff from the actual buildings themselves can go into these planters and percolate into the ground. You get the vegetation, which is obviously makes it a much nicer street than our typical street that we see. Um, infiltration facilities, we've seen a lot of uh, major road projects. The one that really comes to mind is Santa Monica Boulevard. And they tore up that road for what it lasts, like five years, that project. There was an incredible opportunity to do this sort of work where you're actually capturing the runoff and having some green space in the middle and on the sides and actually have it percolate into the ground. Instead, if you look at, if you look at how they've actually built Santa Monica Boulevard, they've done it in a manner where really none of the runoff at all, unless just the rainfall itself, can get into the vegetated area. And that's, that's what we're trying to move away from um, as, a, as a city and as a region. We need to. And here's an interesting example. This is Village Homes up in Davis. And if you've seen these sorts of talks on low-impact development, this is always um, one of the slides that's there. And what's interesting here is that development in Davis was actually built in the 70s. And um, it was done in a manner where they don't have a storm drain system there. All the runoff from the community actually goes into these vegetated swells and um, percolates into the ground. And uh, right now, that development is as compliant with the Clean Water Act as it would have been from the very, very beginning. So it does show you that that low-tech approach was used way back in the 70s, and we're now trying to focus on doing that here. Here's a local example, the Oro Street um, uh, retrofit. It's a Green Streets project right next to the Los Angeles River. On the bottom, that's Steelhead Park, um, which is a small park right next to the river. And there was a wide variety of urban runoff, um, LID BMPs, Green Street BMPs that went in here. It was funded by Proposition O, which was a $500 million bond measure that the city of LA voters um, voted for to clean up LA's most polluted waters. And here's an example of, of a project. We'd like to see a lot more of these Green Street projects. And one of the big pushes has to be, how are we going to move towards every major street retrofit is a Green Street retrofit, um, rather than the way that we're doing things right now. And that's something that would really go a long way towards reducing the pollution problems that we have today. Here's a local urban example, um, again with NRDC. Um, one of the things with LID, where you hear uh, people complain about it, is, well, what do we do in these highly dense areas? How can we put in low impact development um, best management practices in those sorts of situations. And so here's an example. If you know this particular building, it's at 2nd and Arizona in Santa Monica. It's pretty much built lot line to lot line. And what they've done is they capture all the runoff on the roof and then they pipe it all the way down into um, planters at the bottom and then that's, those are filtered and then goes. Um, they actually close the loop completely where then the filtered runoff then comes around and they reuse it. So there's an example where they've actually taken an LID approach in a highly dense urbanized area and it shows you it can indeed be done. Um, sometimes LID doesn't work. Um, and so, for example, if you have very, very high groundwater um, or if you're on a hillside development, then you're going to want to take um, a, more of a treatment approach. And so here's just a few treatment, best management practices uh, that are out there. There's none in particular that are great. Here's filtration systems. Um, these are hydrodynamic separators. There's catch basin filters, catch basin inserts that are getting implemented all over the place in LA County and beyond. Um, green roofs we have not seen in the LA area, but someone told me after my talk earlier today that uh, UCLA was contemplating putting in a green roof in one of their new buildings, which is really exciting. And then just simply rain barrels. Um, you know, obviously there are parts of the world like Bermuda that have been doing this for decades and decades. Uh, you've seen a big push from a local environmental group, Tree People, to really move um, more and more people to actually using cisterns to capture the runoff and then reuse the water. So then we're less reliant on imported potable water. 
So those are all things that can be done. This individual BMP, not one of the more popular ones within the LA region because it's associated with a not very popular development within the LA area. Um, and this is a treatment wetland for Playa Vista. What's interesting about this wetland is it's really the only major treatment wetland that we have, although Augustus Hawkins Park um, in, in downtown LA, um, South LA is another example. But it drains over 1,200 acres from the Westchester area as well as Playa Vista. Um, I would say if it wasn't west of Lincoln Boulevard, it wouldn't be such an unpopular project. Um, the, the ideal would have been obviously that that was, would have been natural wetland, but it was designed to be a treatment wetland and has actually proven to be so far a pretty effective approach at doing that. I only bring that up because it is a local example, one of the few local examples of a regional LID type approach to uh, pollution abatement. Um, so we don't have a lot of that um, because of the built out nature of Los Angeles. But in other parts of the country, this is more the norm. All right, so LID is not the answer to everything on stopping stormwater pollution. Um, and this is really what we need to do to make sure that our beaches don't look land like landfills after every rain, that people can go swimming in the bay without getting sick, all of those other things that we really would like to do. And so here's another thing um, that we really need to change drastically. And bear with me on this particular slide. So, there, this is a best management practice um, performance slide, and the data was gathered from the American Society of Civil Engineers and EPA's uh, website. Um, some friends who I work with um, at Geosyntec, uh, which is a consulting firm, did the analysis. And so this is just a very brief example of the information that's available, which is we have two BMPs here. We have detention basins and biofilters. The website includes probably another dozen or more BMPs. It also includes another dozen or so more um, pollutants as well to look at. And what this shows you is that looking at all of the detention basins that have been studied in the whole United States, all of the biofilters that have been studied in the whole United States over the last 20 plus years, and there's actually been something written about them, that this is how they perform from the standpoint of water quality. What is the effluent quality coming out of each one of these BMPs? And as you can see, the 10th percentile, which means that you know, basically that BMP is better than only 10% of the other detention basins or biofilters out there, that that number is much, much bigger. Whereas if you go to the 90th percentile, which means the best performing within that category, you see a substantial reduction. And so one of the things that we need to do, and this is going to sound common sense probably to everybody in this room, is right now, these treatment devices that are going in the ground, believe it or not, are going in in a completely haphazard way. They don't have to meet any performance standard or criteria. They don't have to deal with any sort of design storm. I mean, is it supposed to treat the half-inch storm, the one-inch storm, the five-inch storm in a 24-hour period? Those sorts of criteria are not standardized in how stormwater pollution is dealt with. And that's not only true here in the LA region, this is true nationally, and a major, major problem with how we're regulating stormwater pollution. So what the suggestion is, and we'll see if it's gonna happen, but it would it really move us a long way towards reducing the amount of pollution going into our rivers, beaches, and bays, is to at least, let's meet the median, the 50th percentile, for the pollution treatment. And so for copper and zinc and, ni and total nitrogen, um, you can see obviously that's a huge improvement over the 10th percentile. And then another argument could be, well, if you already have a, polluted, a pollution problem within an area, so let's say Bayona Creek, for example, which has notorious pollution problems, then you would have to, every best management practice that would be put in within that watershed would have to meet the 75th percentile standard. So let's start moving towards actually improving the water quality in an engineering systematic approach. Remember how I started this talk. I showed you a sewage treatment plant and talked to you about how important it was to upgrade the quality of the sewage treatment. That is not happening in the stormwater arena. And this sort of engineering approach, which is very, very common sense, has not been applied to reducing stormwater pollution. Now, what made 
the, the sewage treatment plant's success so dramatic was a couple of things. If you look back at the history of the Clean Water Act, which is one, there's numeric effluent limits for sewage treatment plants and industrial dischargers. And that means that actually the quality of water that comes out of a sewage treatment plant has to meet very strict water quality numbers. And if it doesn't, it's in violation. In this case, in stormwater, that's not the way the regulations are written. It's written as that basically, whether you're a municipality, an industry, or a construction site, you need to treat the water, in essence, with best management practices to the maximum extent practicable, which probably means, other than Steve Fleischley, probably doesn't mean anything <laughs> to pretty much most people within this room, whereas we do know, hey, if you're only allowed this concentration of copper, then, and if you're over that, you're in violation. It's much, much simpler to actually ratchet down. The other thing that worked very, very well was there were billions of dollars available to sewage treatment plants for upgrades. We don't have the same situation in stormwater at all, although the state is providing some funding to move in that direction, and I told you already about the city of LA. Um, and that's been a big problem. So we don't have the numbers, we don't have the funding, and we certainly haven't had any enforcement as a deterrent. So this technological focus, the low impact development focus, is really a smart way to move in the interim until we can start um, putting numbers into permits. And that's, that's something that I think is very important to healing the bay. Another thing is integrated water resources management approach, which is let's not just focus on stormwater quality, let's realize that stormwater has the additional benefit of potentially being water supply. Um, and that's something that is not being adequately dressed, addressed within the state of California. So we want to maximize water reuse and stormwater recharge of groundwater aquifers. And maximize water reuse, of course, means treated wastewater, and we should be using it for non-potable uses and maybe even indirect potable uses within this area. I'm sure a lot of you caught the news um, a month ago where uh, you had Orange County open up a 75 million gallon per day um, uh, water reuse plant um, for indirect potable reuse, and so the moving in that direction. Getting water districts, like the, the Metropolitan Water District, to create economic incentives for stormwater recharge is very important. They offer 250 bucks per acre foot for, uh, for water reuse. They offer 250 bucks for um, per acre foot for desalination, but they don't have that same sort of economic um, incentive in place for stormwater recharge, that would help a lot. Every time it rains, you see all that water rushing down Bayona Creek, LA River, that's a resource that potentially could be used. State Water Board has not mandated water reuse targets. Um, we could do much, much better on the use of local and state bonds than we have. And then transportation dollars, of which there are billions around, um, mandating the use of a minimum fixed percent on green streets and parking lot retrofit type BMPs would really go a long way to reducing the pollutant loads from the transportation sector. Um, funding, you've heard me talk a little bit about already. Uh, some of the funding measures that have been out there that are literally in the billions um, are, prop, are Measure O and Props 1340, 50, 84, and then 1E that we all voted for uh, overwhelmingly. Uh, but the problem is these funds can only be used for capital improvement projects. So there's no money for operation and maintenance or programs. So we actually have an infrastructure crisis, not because there's not enough money to build infrastructure, but because there's no money at all to actually use the infrastructure. And that's something that we are not addressing at all at the local, state, or federal uh, level. So w this, uh, without getting into detail, Proposition 218 was something that passed about a decade ago. We can't even raise stormwater or flood control fees without a two-thirds vote of the public or a majority vote of property owners. Uh, Santa Monica passed Measure V, two-thirds vote plus 100 people. It barely passed in Santa Monica. What are its chances of passing in Los Angeles or Los Angeles County where uh, the environmental support isn't quite as good as you would have in Santa Monica? LA County is considering a property owner route uh, right now, and we'll see what happens for 2009 to raise billions of dollars to deal with the stormwater pollution problem. What we really need to do is fix the law, and there's something out there right now called Senate Constitutional Amendment 12, to actually, so, so we can amend Prop 218 to allow basically local elect officials to raise fees um, if, if indeed there's an urgent need, or to have a majority vote rather than a two-thirds vote. 
and I already talked about the economic incentives. So those are some of the things we can do on the stormwater pollution side. Whoops. All right, so other major pollution sources that we have in the Bay, and I'll go through these even, even more quickly. Um, human sewage in recreational waters. We shouldn't be having that at all because our storm drain system is completely separate from our sewer system. Um, unfortunately, we still end up finding a wide variety of pathogens, uh, microbes that can cause you to get sick, that are actually uh, within our storm drain system. And these are some of the sources, leaky sewer lines, septic tanks, um, swimmers, you can have bathers shedding uh, pathogens or illicit connections to the storm drain system. This is what uh, we've done to most of our rivers in LA. I'm sure you guys are all too familiar. And these sources, as you know, go into the storm drain and onto our beaches without any treatment whatsoever in almost all circumstances. So this is an example of a, a Malibu Creek watershed, and this is Malibu Lagoon right there, and then world famous Surfrider Beach. And this is what you see all too often when the lagoon is breached. You see these warning signs all over the place. Uh, there was a health effects study that I was involved with, uh, Robert Hale, who's now at USC, and others. And basically, if you swim in front of a flowing storm drain, you're far more likely to come down with stomach flu or upper respiratory infection or skin rash. Um, and there's been a lot that has gone on on beach pollution um, over the years. One of the things that we see is that when you have a pollution source like a storm drain right on the beach, you're likely to have uh, poorer water quality than you are in an open ocean beach. Um, here's an example of Santa Monica Pier, which right now, along with Avalon Beach, is probably one of the two, or probably the two most polluted beaches in the entire state of California. So we have a leaky storm drain underneath that pier with very, very high bacteria counts that end up leaching their way into the water there. Here we have an enclosed beach, Mother's Beach, very poor water circulation there, so often the water quality there is poor. And this is generally true for any enclosed beach, is that we see that the water circulation is so poor that generally that's the last place you'd want to take your little kid to go swimming. <laughs> and then here's an open ocean beach, a Venice Beach Pier, where you don't have a storm drain, and here the, the beach water quality there is generally excellent. So it shows you there's a big difference if you don't have a pollution source on what the water quality is. Um, I'm not going to get into detail on all the new regs uh, over the last 10 years that have gone in to improve public right to know on what water quality is, but it has made a dramatic improvement. Um, these are the sorts of warning signs you see at polluted beaches. Um, and we, of course, have put in our, our beach report card where we grade over 450 beaches throughout the state of California on a weekly basis, on an A to F basis. And this is what it looks like on our website. Um, but the solutions are many. What works the best are these low flow diversions. And this actually captures the runoff before it gets to the beach and just pumps it into the sewer system. Simplest possible solution, keep the pollution off the beach to begin with. Another example are these uh, packaged treatment plants, like the dry weather runoff reuse facility near Santa Monica Pier. There's a few others. These, if they're properly operated and maintained, can do a pretty good job at reducing polluted runoff. Again, these are dry weather runoff solutions. So this isn't going to make the beach safe after a storm. This is only keeping the beach safe for you during the summer. Now, this area right here, which I don't have too much time to get into, is the total maximum daily loads. And this is really the, the face of clean water nowadays and, and something that um, Steve, um, when he and, at the Baykeeper with Heal the Bay and Natural Resources Defense Council have really been doing a lot of work um, on, on TMDLs within the LA area and beyond. And what it is is sort of the safety net in the Clean Water Act. And when the rest of the Clean Water Act isn't working and you still have pollution problems where your beaches aren't safe for swimming or they're um, or, or they're not safe for aquatic life, or you can't use them for drinking water, for, for upstream waters, those sorts of issues. You basically have site-specific water quality standards, and these standards can be put into stormwater permits. Remember how I was telling you before, stormwater permits don't have numeric effluent limits. When you have a TMDL, that's a situation where you can actually put those numbers into a stormwater permit, and so then, for the first time, stormwater permits are enforceable and can really make a difference. So here we are in Santa Monica Bay, where the only beaches, and this is actually within our region, the only beaches in the country where 
from April through October, 100% of the time, our beaches must be safe for swimming. They have to meet water quality standards. And if they're not, they're in violation of the law. And you, as a community group or a neighborhood association, can actually sue local government, if you chose to, um, to make sure that that beach was cleaned up. And that is a very powerful tool indeed um, and goes a long way towards cleaning up our beaches. So we've seen huge improvements in water quality in Santa Monica Bay beaches over the last couple of years because the compliance deadline has come and gone for that April through October time period. Um, and uh, the other major um, improvement has been through the Clean Beach Initiative. There's been more than $100 million that have been allocated to clean up some of California's most polluted beaches. And a lot of these projects I was talking about earlier, like diversions and package treatment plants, have been funded um, in that way. Um, also, uh, lawsuits, the Santa Monica Baykeeper had their successful sewage infrastructure suit, so hopefully less sewage spills going into the bay, improves water quality, and makes things a lot safer for swimmers, and uh, the funding measures I was talking about before. I'll skip over that. And so bottom line, is it safe to swim in Santa Monica Bay? Well, last summer, more than 95% of the coast was actually safe for swimming in dry weather. That's the whole state. Of course, it was the driest year on record in the last 100 plus years, so that didn't hurt matters. Um, but um, in general, things are good as long as you're away from a pollution source. Um, and obviously, everything changes dramatically during wet weather. And that's, that's the key thing. We have barely scratched the surface, as you saw in that early slide, in really tackling the stormwater pollution problem. And those solutions are obviously much more difficult. All right, other sources of pollution, I'll go through these very, very quickly. We have the worst DDT hotspot on the face of the planet. Um, it's off of the Palos Verdes shelf and actually uh, Palos Verdes slope as well. 17 square kilometers, 110 tons of DDT, lots of contaminated fish. Uh, this is your classic biomagnification uh, diagram. So you have the contaminants on the bottom, move their way up the food chain. And uh, you see at the top the predator, the, the bald eagle. Um, I'm not going to get into details here, uh, but obviously there's been a long history. From 1947 to 1972, the Montrose Chemical Company was the largest manufacturer of DDT on the planet. And so they had actually discharged through the sewer system more than 1,700 tons of DDT. So that was the legacy that we got. The good news is, I'm sure a lot of you caught, California Brown Pelican coming off the Endangered Species Act. That seems to be imminent. Um, the other exciting news of last year was for the very first time in at least four decades, you saw the bald eagle nest successfully on Catalina Island. So it does show you that the DDT uh, uh, legacy has been slightly reducing over time. We still have highly contaminated bottom fish um, in parts of Santa Monica Bay. The closer you get to San Pedro Bay and the Palos Verdes Shelf, the more contaminated the fish are. And bottom dwelling fish like white croaker are the most contaminated. So what's the solution to this problem? I can't be optimistic on that. EPA is going to basically give you the same solution that any th um, three-year-old would give you if, whenever they saw something in the sandbox, they'd bury it. And so they're going to end up trying to find clean sediment and spot cap it off the Palos Verdes shelf. That's probably where this is going. Um, EPA's recommendations will finally be coming out this year. And this was after 10 years of regulation and seven, eight years of putting together a remediation plan. All right, so that map that you see on the bottom really hasn't changed all that much, although this hot spot is gone, but the most contaminated fish are over there. And so um, those are some of the recommendations for eating fish. And then finally, in conclusion, another major problem we have is trash in the ocean. We know it's a, a global marine debris crisis at this point. Um, this is Santa Monica Beach after rain, uh, obviously not a pretty sight. Do you think we have a styrofoam problem? Yeah, I think so. Um, we also have problems where you can see balloons can look like sea animals, so you can see this would be very uh, inviting for a wide variety of marine life to eat. Uh, this is what Viona Creek looks like at the trash berm uh, after a rain, and that's not as bad as I've seen it, so it actually can get worse than that. And this gives you an idea of the size of the impact locally, um, and uh, it's much bigger on a, on a global scale than what we're talking about here. Um, actually, a recent statistic was that for plastic bags, which I'll get into in a second, where we've actually seen uh, the city of San Francisco, which implemented a ban last year, 
has costed out about 17 cents per bag on what it costs the city to actually deal with um, the trash problem caused by a plastic bag. So that's interesting on the cost side. So we think the annual LA County trash cleanup cost, that's only for the beach and is a gross, gross underestimate. And so we need a new, a new number on that. On trash TMBL, similar to what I was talking about, the beach, uh, zero trash in Biona Creek and the LA River by 2014. What you're seeing is all these inserts these, on all the catch basins. There's um, roughly 75,000 or more catch basins. I think over 100,000 come to think of it within the whole LA County area. And most of those are actually going to be put in in the next two years. Um, that's not going to actually achieve zero trash, but it will achieve compliance for them the way the actual trash TMDL is written. But again, at least there's some sort of enforceable mechanism to keep trash out of our waterways. Uh, what's going on locally? Well, on polystyrene and bags, what's interesting about plastic bags is that this, is, this addiction to single-use plastic packaging is something that's been recent. Uh, we didn't have plastic bags in grocery stores prior to 1977. Uh, we have seen some progress in this regard on polystyrene ban for Santa Monica. Just uh, is now in every restaurant as of last Saturday. So there are some that are violating if you've been eating in Santa Monica. Um, let us know if you find them out. And then Malibu, Calabasas, Huntington Beach, Ventura, um, all passed uh, blown polystyrene bans. Berkeley did long ago. West Hollywood did long ago. So they've been um, styrofoam free for quite some time. County of Los Angeles, uh, considering a plastic bag and styrofoam ban, they kind of uh, didn't do such a hot job on the plastic bag ban. Um, and we were protesting that right before the vote. And bag bans, though, to show you how much of a global issue this has become. You actually had China, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, et cetera, um, that are all uh, moving forward on bag bans. And then fees you, in Ireland and Germany, Ireland's 33 cents per bag. So that's obviously a significant deterrent. And I think they've had a 98% reduction in bag use from that. The county passed that weaker measure that I was talking about before. Um, and then Santa Monica. Uh, next Tuesday, we'll consider a plastic bag ban, which will probably be the most far-reaching, maybe even in the world, but definitely within the country, um, and, and how they're going to deal with that. And I bring that up because that is obviously not a scientific solution to a problem. It's basically social change, which gets us to, you're not going to solve the pollution problems in Santa Monica Bay unless we change the waste disposal behavior of all 10 million people that live in Los Angeles County. And so that's where we need to go. It's very, very difficult to mandate that. But this is kind of what you're seeing the environmental community move towards, is, is to legislate solutions at a local level um, because of the lack of leadership that we're seeing at the state and national level on, on taking on these issues. Um, probably not the most effective way to go. The good news is a lot of businesses are obviously making greening what they're doing a real high priority. So Whole Foods on their own, for example, won't use plastic bags after April 22nd, Earth Day of this year. So um, hopefully that'll be a movement that more and more people will catch on to. And that's it. So, all right.